Welcome to the second part of the Economics for Business Monetary Policy Lecture, Lecture 10. To recap on the first part of Lecture 10, I considered the United States subprime loan crisis and how that had created a global financial crisis that created a banking crisis. In part one, I looked at the risks arising from the 2008 banking crisis. The first risk was that a lack of bank liquidity reduced bank lending to the wider economy and may also risk runs on the banks by depositors who become afraid that they will be unable to get their money back from the banks. The second risk I considered was the potential for the financial crisis to lead to the insolvency uh, failure of banks and financial institutions and the, the impact this would have on confidence in the banking system. The financial crisis also risk leading to a cycle of debt deflation that would lead to reduced consumption and economic activity in the wider economy. In this part of Lecture 10, I will consider the response of governments and monetary authorities to the 2008 financial crisis. I will explain monetary policy and expansionary monetary policy. I will discuss Keynes' liquidity preference theory to show how the monetary authorities can reduce interest rates. And I will use the monetary transmission mechanisms theory to describe the channels by which lower interest rates can impact the wider economy. First of all, I would like to define monetary policy. Monetary policy refers to monetary authorities influencing interest rates, where interest rates represent the price of money. The amount of money in an economy, which is the money supply, bank reserve ratios and credit terms, in order to achieve economic objectives, such as increased employment, increased economic growth, reduced inflation. Monetary policy influences the general structure of interest rates in the economy, which influences both aggregate expenditure and also the rate of inflation in an economy. Expansionary monetary policy is where the monetary authorities expand money supply in order to reduce interest rates and the consequent reduction in interest rates encourages both companies and individuals to increase their levels of borrowing which promotes increased consumer expenditure and investment which promotes growing economic activity. One aspect of expansionary monetary policy is quantitative easing whereby the central bank purchases assets from banks and non-bank financial institutions, which causes an increase in bond prices. The resulting increase in bond prices lowers the yield on bonds, for reasons that I will explain later, reducing the cost of borrowing in the wider economy. Monetary authorities' quantitative easing also puts extra money in the system, which boosts banks' reserves, giving banks a greater capacity to lend to individuals and businesses in the wider economy. However, an expansionary monetary policy risks creating inflationary pressure. So now I will look at the economic theory with regard to how the monetary authorities, for example, the Central Bank, the Bank of England, influence interest rates. Economists believe that there are three motives for holding money. The classical school assumed that the only reason people hold money is to conduct transactions. So money is a medium of exchange for completing transactions. And so the balances, money balances are active. They are continually circulating, being used to conduct transactions. So the classical school identified the transactions motive for holding money 
basically people hold money to buy stuff, both goods and services. And also the classical school presented the precautionary motive, which suggests that people maintain cash balances to facilitate unexpected transactions because people are uncertain of the exact timing of the receipts and payments. So they need to have some money in reserve to cover unexpected eventualities, keeping a bit of money to one side for a rainy day sort of thing. Now, this demand to hold transactions and precautionary balances is motivated by the desire to conduct transactions and so therefore is unaffected by the rate of interest. So the classical school considers that uh, demand for money is inelastic with respect to interest rates. However, John Maynard Keynes introduced a further motive for holding money, which he referred to as a speculative or asset motive for holding money. Now, this arose because Keynes recognised that people can also hold money as a store of wealth. Now, these are idle balances because they, these will be held by people for possibly a considerable period of time because they prefer to hold their wealth in the form of money rather than other assets which they believe may fall in value. So Keynes believed that money is an asset class, just like government treasury stock, which are also referred to as bonds, property and company shares. And money is an asset class. Money is desirable because the value of money is fixed, whereas the price of other assets may fall in value. Not only is John Maynard Keynes a renowned economist, but he was also a very successful investor. He was bursar for King's College, Cambridge. At the time when John Maynard Keynes was investing for Cambridge, all of um, endowment funds were invested in treasury stock, gilt edge securities, in order to maintain the value of the asset that they were investing. The trustees of the endowment fund wanted to be seen as a good steward of the funds and so therefore chose to invest in treasury stock bonds that were unlikely to fall in value. However, Keynes believed that company shares offered a better investment vehicle and he was a highly successful investor. I would now like to discuss treasury stock, um, also referred to as bonds. Now, these have been known as treasury gilts since 2005 to 2006. And treasury stock, which I will continue to refer to throughout this presentation as treasury stock, have a maturity date of more than one year. Change in terminology to treasury gilts uh, links to the term gilt edged being a traditional term that has been used to refer to UK government debt due to the near certainty that the sovereign authority that can print its own money will repay government debt. But whilst it is almost certain that a sovereign government that can print its own money will repay government debt, it is possible if there is a significant amount of debt that printing money to repay both debt and debt interest could lead to inflation in the currency area where inflation refers to a general increase in the level of prices. Following the redefinition of treasury stock to treasury gilts in 2005-06 Following that event, Moody's Credit Rating Agency have downgraded UK government debt from AAA, which is the highest possible credit rating that a credit rating agency can provide, um, and downgraded the credit rating uh, in 2013, and then downgraded the UK's debts, the UK government's debt credit rating again in 2017. Currently, the British government's credit rating in April 2020 is AA2, which is still very good, 
but it is below the AAA rating that it had up to 2013. In the future, a reduction in the UK government's credit rating could increase the government's cost of borrowing to reflect the increased risk to lenders of credit default by the UK government. Treasury stock prior to 1998 was issued by the Bank of England and a cheque for interest on the debt was received from the Bank of England. However, since April 1998, Treasury stock has been issued by the UK Debt Management Office, often referred to as DMO, which is an executive agency of the UK Government's Treasury. So, for example, I purchased Treasury stock 15% 1985 in 1979. Now, coupon rate refers to the fi fixed cash payment defined in terms of a percentage yield received from owning a bond that has a £100 issue price. All UK bonds are issued at a face value of £100. So, in the case of the above bond, which I purchased in 1979, the coupon rate is 15% which entitled me to £15 per annum per £100 bond with the payment being made by the Bank of England in two equal semi-annual payments which refers to a payment being made every six months a half yearly payment. The yield on the Treasury stock reflected the money market interest rates at the time when the bond was issued. In 1979, market interest rates, money market interest rates, were just over 15%. Coupon date refers to the date when a bond matures. In the case of the above bond that I purchased in 1979, it is referred to as Treasury Stock 15% 1985, and so the maturity date is 1985. In the year of the maturity, when the bond matures, the owner receives their final interest payment and the return of the face value of their bond, £100. Some bonds were issued via a tendering process, an auction. And in the above case, investors could bid from £97.50 per £100 bond. Now a tendering process provides the government with an opportunity to increase the revenue they receive because the highest bidders receive the available stock. So if the Treasury stock is in high demand the government could potentially receive £110 for every £100 face value of stock. However, this auction, this tendering process, also provides investors with an opportunity to increase their yield. So, for example, the above bond was sold through a tendering process and an investor bidding £97.50 for 15% Treasury stock 1985 with a face value of £100 would increase their bond yield from 15% to 15.4%. So... Kane suggested that holding bonds creates a potential for financial gain or loss that is not present when holding money. Uh, the government bond or treasury stock price varies according to the variable money market interest rate because it provides an interest rate which is often referred to as a yield that is fixed at the time of issue and is usually a percentage of the nominal bond value of £100. Whereas the value of money is fixed and earns a money market interest rate that varies according to money market conditions a particular, at a particular point in time. So this creates an inverse relationship between bond prices and money market interest rates. And investors will vary their holding of money 
according to their expectations of future changes in bond treasury stock prices, which creates a speculative demand for money. Investors make a capital gain by buying bonds when the bond price is like to rise, and the bond price will rise as a consequence of variable market interest rates falling. Because falling money market interest rates cause bond prices to rise. So investors will buy bonds when they anticipate bond prices rising in the future, which will generate a capital gain on their bond holdings. So I mentioned earlier of uh, the Treasury bond 15% 1985. Now I purchased Treasury stock 15% 1985 in 1979. And you will see that in 1979, interest rates were over 15%. And so I acquired the Treasury stock in 1979, uh, which matured in 1985. And it paid 15% on the face value of the bond at £100. So I received £15 per year on each £100 Treasury stock. Now... When interest rates fell, I continued to acquire £15 on every £100 stock, i.e. 15% rate of return, when other people were seeing interest rates falling, and ultimately interest rates fell to 10%. Now, anybody who was investing money in a bank and achieved an interest rate of 10% would consider that a 15% bond was highly attractive so in those conditioned in those conditions the 15 percent treasury stock 1985 which i initially purchased at 98 pounds for every 100 pound of stock actually increase in price because it's generating a much better return than investors can acquire in the money markets and i will explain that relationship in more detail later Investors avoid a capital loss by selling bonds when the bond price is like to fall. And this is a consequence of money market interest rates being expected to increase in the future. So increasing money market interest rates cause bond prices to fall. Remember, bond prices are fixed at the time of issue. And so therefore, you can uh, lock in uh, a high interest rate when money market interest rates are expected to fall, that causes bond prices to rise. And in this situation, you don't want to lock in at low money market interest rates, uh, a bond yield, which will become unattractive when money market interest rates increase in the future. So investors will sell bonds if they expect bond prices to fall in the future in order to avoid a capital loss on their bond holdings. Because when you buy bonds, you're basically locking in the current interest rate uh, or yield, it's called, with bonds. Next, I will present an example of how bond prices are calculated. And for this example, I will use an example of an undated bond, which is often referred to as a console. One example of a console is a war loan which were issued during the Second World War. Keynes was a supporter of the issue of war loans because during the Second World War there was a requirement for the government to obtain a significantly larger proportion of national output which would usually lead to inflationary pressures within the economy. In order to reduce inflationary pressures during a wartime situation, removing demand from the private sector would enable the government to spend more on ammunition and weapons without creating inflation. So war loans provided a means for the government to reduce the purchasing power of the private sector, enabling the government to spend more money without creating inflationary pressures and so therefore the government could uh, acquire more munitions with the money that was available. So in a sense they got a bigger bang for every book they spent. So the bond price 
is determined by the face value of a bond. And as I mentioned previously, each bond uh, is issued at £100 value. That face value is then multiplied by the coupon rate of the bond, the interest rate that is defined on the bond, the percentage interest rate, divided by the percentage money market interest rate. So, for example, if we take an example of a treasury stock, an undated treasury stock, offering a rate of 4%, uh, given that that 4% interest is based on the value of a £100 stock, then that generates an annual £4 return on every £100 of stock that the investor holds. Now, if we assume that the variable money market interest rate is 2%, then the value of the treasury stock is £100 face value multiplied by the percentage coupon rate of the bond, which in this case is 4%, divided by the 2% variable money market interest rate. Now, 4 over 2 equals 2. So if we then multiply 2 by the £100 value, face value of the bond, we get £200. So the 4% treasury stock, when it achieves a price of £200, the £4 annual return is equivalent to a running yield or interest yield of 2%, which is the same as the variable money market interest rate of 2%. And so at a price of £200, investors have no inclination either to move money in or out of the treasury stock because it is providing the same rate of return they could get by placing their money in the money market. However, after saying that, the calculation of bond prices is slightly more complicated because you also need to take into account the fact that there are transaction costs associated with purchasing treasury stock that don't exist when you move money in and out of the money market with treasury stock you need to pay commission for purchasing the stock and selling the stock. A second factor that will need to be taken into account is the fact that you will also need to take account of uh, likely changes in money market interest rates for the duration of the bond, which I will discuss next when considering the yield curve. Investors do not only consider the current market interest rate when determining the rate of return they require from bonds. They also look uh, to the future and likely changes in future interest rates during the term of the bond. And this, these are the expectations of investors with regard to changes in future rates of return are represented in the yield curve. The yield curve is a line presenting the yield or interest rate required by investors to purchase bonds that have are of the same credit quality, guilt edged securities, but at different maturity dates. And investors' required rate of return is influenced by investors' time preference for money. So there is an expectation that people prefer to have money now rather than later, and so will require a greater return in order to give up their money for longer. Um, and also, expected interest rate changes are, are important in determining the rate of return required by bondholders for putting the money with the government for a period of time. And so investors will identify the factors that are likely to influence future interest rates, such as changes in the rate of future inflation, uh, changes in the exchange rate of the currency, which will impact on the inflation rate within a um, currency area. They will also look at potential for change in rates of return on capital employed. Um, so, for example, in a period when there is rapid technological process, there can be very high returns from investing capital. So they don't want to lock in uh, to a low bond yield if they're expecting innovations, technological innovations, 
that may enable them to to invest in uh, higher yielding investment in, in, in those companies engaging those particular technologies. Also, the rate of economic growth is important. Not only are people concerned about returns, but also they're also looking at risks. And so they will look at the economic risks uh, that are likely to occur in future. And the fact that the longer you give the money to the government, the more likely there are to be risks that you couldn't envisage at the time generally means that people also require a higher return if they give their money to the government for a longer period. And so the usual yield curve is upward sloping. If the yield curve is downward sloping, it is usually an indicator of recession. This is the yield curve from the Bank of England website on the 14th of April 2020. And it shows that the yield for short dated securities is relatively low, so around 0.2%. However, if we go 15 years into the future, the required rate of return uh, increases to 1.2% before falling to 35 years ahead to zero. This humped type of yield curve is extremely unusual and may well indicate the significance of the Bank of England purchasing treasury stock, both short dated and long dated. And this emphasis on buying short dated and long dated treasury stock will increase the price of those treasury stock and thereby reduce the interest rate yield on the stock given that the rate of return is fixed in money terms at the time that the treasury stock is issued. So when Keynes was talking about speculative demand for money he used treasury stock also referred to as government bonds as an example. However, you can consider whether other assets, for example, shares and property, can be considered to have similar features to a bond. So, for example, they provide a future stream of income over a period of time. So, property provides rental income after deducting expenses for property repair and maintenance. Um, company shares, sometimes referred to as equity, provide the investor with a share in the company's stream of future profits. Um, and the discount rate that is used to determine the present value of a future stream of income is influenced by money market interest rates. The classical school believed that the only motives for holding money were to conduct transactions. And so they developed the transactions demand and precautionary demand for holding money. And you will notice that that is interest inelastic. The motive for holding money is driven by the desire to conduct transactions. It is not influenced by interest rates. However, Keynes introduced a speculative demand for money. And you will notice that at very high interest rates, there is a very low demand to hold money. Because people perceive that in the future interest rates will fall and so they want to lock in when interest rates are very high the historically high money market interest rates which they anticipate falling in the future. So they move into purchase of bonds, property and shares uh, which are at very low prices due to the very high cost of capital. Similarly, the speculative demand to hold money is very high when interest rates are extremely low because you don't want to be locked into a bond or share or property generating a very low rate of return when money market interest rates are likely to rise because it is likely that those asset prices will fall. And so Money is a safe haven 
when uh, there is a risk of asset prices falling, creating a speculative demand for money amongst investors. And this is very noticeable with the value of the dollar. You tend to notice when global asset prices, the price of financial assets and property are falling around the world, then the dollar's value rises relative to other currencies because investors perceive that the dollar is a good safe haven for putting their money into. Uh, the dollar uh, exchange rate markets are very liquid and you can move large amounts of money in and out of the dollar um, with very low risk of uh, a fall in the dollar's price. Once we add in Keynes' speculative motive for holding money, then we can create a money demand curve or a liquidity preference schedule that combines transactions demand for holding money, precautionary demand for holding money, and speculative demand for holding money. Reference to the dollar when discussing the speculative demand for money refers to the American dollar. And then if we present the supply of money put into the economy by the central bank, given a certain money demand curve determined by transactions, precautionary, speculative motives for holding money, then we are able to determine the equilibrium rate of interest, which as in all economic graphs, is where money supply is equal to money demand. That will determine the equilibrium money market interest rate. Next, I would like to discuss expansionary monetary policy and more specifically quantitative easing. First, I would like to explain monetization. So monetization refers to the central bank creating money to purchase interest-bearing government debt. So when government expenditure exceeds tax revenue, it must borrow from the public. If the government has a significant amount of debt outstanding, it may choose to purchase its own debt with newly printed currency. The government has thereby replaced its interest-bearing debts with money and has thus monetized a part of its debt. A consequence of purchasing debt with money is that the money supply is increased, which increases bank reserves that enables banks to increase their lending. And also, because of the increase in money supply, there's a reduction in interest rates which incentivize economic agents to borrow more, causes economic agents in the private sector, both individuals and companies, to increase their purchase of goods and services and purchase more assets, which raises the price of both goods and services and assets and is thus likely to generate inflation. It will generate more inflation in the sectors to which the new money is allocated. Consequently, debt monetization to finance a deficit often creates inflation as a consequence of this approach being adopted to finance government deficits. Next, I would like to explain quantitative easing. Quantitative easing refers to the Bank of England using their asset purchase facility to purchase treasury stock from private sector financial institutions, which includes both bank and non-bank financial institutions in order to increase the money supply. And I have placed a couple of links to a Bank of England video that explains quantitative easing and a page on the Bank of England website discussing quantitative easing. So the Bank of England purchased bonds in secondary markets. Quantitative easing also includes the purchase of private sector bonds, such as corporate bonds issued by companies such as IBM, BMW. Um, and in America, um, the quantitative easing program by the Federal Reserve Bank also included the purchase of mortgage-backed securities. When the government engages in quantitative easing, which is often referred to as QE, 
their intention is to sell the purchased government bonds back to the financial markets at some point in the future. If their intention is that they are not going to sell the bonds that they have purchased back to the financial markets at some point in the future, then the central bank's purchase of bonds is referred to as overt monetary financing rather than being quantitative easing. And we can see the timeline for changes in quantitative easing by the Bank of England. So over the period 2009 to 2010, the Bank of England issued 200 billion of new money to purchase primarily government bonds, but also some private bonds from private financial institutions, both banks and non-bank financial institutions. And then 2012 to 13, there was another 175 billion of quantitative easing. And so if we go back to liquidity preference theory, we can see the impact of QE. Increasing money supply from money supply one to money supply two. So by putting money into the markets through buying both government and private bonds, the Bank of England has increased money supply. And the increase in money supply has led to a reduction in interest rates from IR1 to IRQE, which stands for the interest rate after quantitative easing. And you can see that in 2008-9, the consequence of quantitative easing was that interest rates fell from 5.5% down to 0.5%. So a reduction of 5% in market interest rates from 5.5% to 0.5% as a consequence of quantitative easing. So as I've just mentioned, the additional central bank demand for government bonds, when you increase demand for an asset, then its price rises. But this rise in price reduces bond yields, given that the annual financial return from a bond is defined as a percentage of the initial coupon price the initial £100 bond price. So a 2% return is £2 for every £100 bond. And so we can see from this chart, we've taken the price of Treasury stock 4.25%, 2046. You can see how the price of that stock has varied uh, since it was issued in 2006. Um, it would have been initially issued at around £100. It fell below £100 in 2006. But then the fall in interest rates caused the bond price to rise significantly from 2010. So you could buy it at £100 in 2010, but by the current period, that Treasury stock was selling at £184. So a 84% increase in value um, relative to its issue price. And that increase in bond prices, you can see from this chart showing changing bond yields uh, over a period since uh, 1980, you can see a continuous decline in bond yields as a result of a continual increase in bond prices that is a consequence of a continual fall in money market interest rates since 1980. So I've talked about how quantitative easing is done. I would now like to discuss the impact of quantitative easing. So quantitative easing is where the central bank purchases treasury bonds, which enables the government to issue new treasury bonds to the market and there's a pool of liquidity there to to buy the new bonds that the government is issuing so it is used as a precursor to the government uh, placing new treasury stock onto the market however we also need to consider that 
the financial institutions, both bank and non-bank private financial institutions, that have sold their treasury stock and some private bonds to the Bank of England then have quite a lot of money. And because the increased demand for treasury stock from the Bank of England buying up treasury stock has increased the price of treasury stock and thereby reduced bond yields, treasury stock now look relatively less attractive than they originally did compared to other asset types such as property and company shares. And so financial institutions are incentivized to invest the money they receive from the Bank of England, but they are unlikely to purchase treasury bonds that have now have a much lower yield. And so the financial institutions put their money into either property or company shares that offer a higher rate of return. So what we often see is that QE leads to a movement of funds between different asset classes. Um, so non-bank financial institutions start to purchase property and financial assets and that helps provide support to the price of these assets which prevents a reduction in property and financial asset prices which was quite important in the 2008 financial crisis because not only was government looking to borrow more money uh, in order to increase economic activity at a time when economic activity could have uh, w was likely to fall and lead to a recession but also in the financial crisis governments wanted to protect the liquidity of the banking system and also avoid insolvency of banks and so by non-bank financial institutions purchasing large amounts of property and financial assets there was 200 billion pounds of new money there for them to invest by purchasing those assets it helped to keep those asset prices up and in, in fact caused those asset prices to increase which prevented the people who'd borrowed money to purchase those assets from seeing their asset prices fall below the amount of money they owed and therefore walking away from their debts, defaulting on their debts and leaving the banks with significant write-offs. So uh, not only did QE and A provide the liquidity of the financial markets that helped government borrow, but it also helped to support the price of property and financial assets at a time when those prices could have fallen heavily. So the maintaining of property and financial asset prices prevented speculators being bankrupted by falling property and financial asset prices, which could have caused them to default on their loans, causing their loans to become non-performing, which might have caused the banks to write down their assets to less than their liabilities, which would have led to bank insolvencies. The beneficiaries from quantitative easing were those with property and financial assets that benefited from the resulting increase in the value of the financial and property assets. So we can see that quantitative easing had a number of benefits. It provided liquidity to the markets that enabled the government to sell new government debt into the financial markets. It helped to support property and financial asset prices. But in any situation where the supply of something is increased, its price will tend to fall. And so we can look at the change in the purchasing power of pound sterling by looking at the price of pound sterling in relation to gold so the pound value of gold per troy ounce and we can see that prior to quantitative easing um, you could buy a troy ounce of gold for approximately 336 pounds and then 
following 200 billion pounds of quantitative easing increasing the supply of money in the economy we can see that the price of gold increased to 634 uh, the price of gold almost doubled and that occurred before the quantitative easing had actually taken place in the economy so here were investors moving into gold prior to the supply of sterling being increased and we can then see that there was a further increase of 175 billion in quantitative easing and we can see again that the gold price moved prior to that quantitative easing taking place so the gold price went from 585 pounds to over a thousand pounds again almost a doubling of the price of gold in relation to pound sterling as a result of a quantitative easing of, of two of 175 billion by the Bank of England and we can see that more recently the gold price increased from nine nine hundred and ninety nine hundred ninety five pounds to uh, oh, around at the moment it's around 1370 pound and that has occurred even before the government instigated the latest quantitative easing so the gold price is responding prior to quantitative easing it started responding in, in March 2019 to quantitative easing that only started to occur in April 2020 so investors uh, recognize the likely impact on the purchasing power the price of a currency well before the quantitative easing occurs so I mentioned quantitative easing which is where the Bank of England purchased Treasury stock in secondary markets Treasury stock that have previously been issued by the Bank of England to help finance government activities there is an alternative approach and that is direct monetary financing so there is an opportunity for the Bank of England to innovate by providing money directly to the UK Treasury in return for government bonds this is a primary market and is referred to as direct monetary financing if the government engage in direct monetary financing it can mean that more of the money that is used by the Bank of England goes directly to support government expenditure because there are no intermediaries to pay there are no agents in the financial markets who require a percentage to facilitate the sale of government bonds onto the market there is no potential increase in the bond price which means that the Bank of England has to pay more for the bond than the government originally initially received from selling of the bonds and this would be a longer term variant of the Bank of England's Ways and Means facility which is an overdraft facility for the British government the Bank of England Ways and Means facility um, which is only, only provides short term financing to government reached 20 billion after the 2008 financial crisis and uh, this was 20 billion of new money provided directly to the government to support the immediate needs of the government for funding whilst we're looking at liquidity preference theory it's also important to mention the liquidity trap and the liquidity trap uh, was presented by Keynes who said that at very low interest rates the liquidity preference schedule is almost wholly interest elastic due to the speculative demand for money motive and so at extremely low money market interest rates such as at the moment the Bank of England base rate is only 0.1% in April 2020 investors have a preference to hold money rather than bonds and company shares and property when investors perceive that interest rates are likely to increase in the future which will re reduce the value of those assets so when a money market interest rates are extremely low 
investors will sell their bonds and other financial assets and property because they anticipate that higher interest rates will cause those asset prices to fall in the future, uh, which would cause them to incur a loss on the value of their bond holdings. So in times of very low interest rates, then investors will just want to hold lots of cash, or lots of money. And they will limit their holdings of assets, financial assets, property, treasury stock. And also, when there is high levels of indebtedness, the banks perceive there's limited credit worthiness of individuals in the economy to take on more debt. And so banks will tend to retain any cash they receive. So liquidity trap causes interest rates to be relatively unresponsive to money supply increases when interest rates are very low. And we can see here that if the money supply is increased by the Bank of England from MS2 to MS3, then all that new money is taken up by investors because they don't want to have assets. And so it's impossible for the Bank of England, therefore, to reduce interest rates below IR2 because of the liquidity trap. Increases in money supply beyond money supply 2 will simply be held by investors in idle cash balances and will have no impact on money market interest rates. This traditional representation of liquidity preference theory diagram that has vertical money supply lines suggests that the central bank has complete control of money supply. However, as we saw in Lecture 9, uh, the commercial private banks, because of their ability to create new deposits and new credit money, have the ability to increase money supply. And so the money supply lines presented on this diagram are not completely accurate factors that lead to increases in money supply in the real world. So in the last part of the lecture, I explained how the monetary authorities reduce interest rates by increasing the supply of money into the financial system. In the final part of this lecture, I will discuss the monetary transmission mechanisms that explain how lower interest rates lead to increased economic activity. And this is a diagram which provides an overview of those forces and how they will impact on economic activity. And I will now look at each of those elements in turn. So first of all, when looking at the monetary transmission mechanisms, I will discuss the exchange rate channel. Falling interest rates give investors an incentive to move their money to other currency areas that offer higher interest rates, higher yields on financial assets. And also it reduces foreign investors' desire to place their money in the UK because of the relatively low returns they're getting on UK financial assets and property and treasury stock. And as a consequence of investors relocating their money, there's a reduction in pound sterling exchange rate. Investors in UK assets are increasingly selling those assets and moving their money abroad to acquire a better rate of return, which means supplying pounds sterling onto the foreign exchange markets in order to acquire other currencies. And similarly, there's a reduced demand for pounds sterling from foreign investors as rates of return on UK assets become relatively less attractive than rates of return available in other currency areas. In any supply and demand diagram, if you increase the supply of something and reduce the demand for something at the same time, then its price will fall in relation to other currencies. However, the fall in sterling is good for businesses 
that uh, produce goods and services because the fall in pound sterling reduces the price of UK source products in foreign export markets. The lower price of UK source products makes UK produced goods more price competitive in foreign markets and that should increase the demand for UK exports. Also, the lower pound sterling exchange rate increases the price of foreign produced products that are being sold in the UK and that is likely to reduce demand for imported products for two reasons. First of all, the fall in pound sterling exchange rate means that foreign goods become more expensive in the UK so UK consumers have less purchasing power which reduces the amount of goods they can purchase in real terms because of the increase in the price of the product their incomes have not changed and so therefore they can afford less. Secondly because of the higher price of foreign produced goods that are imported into the UK British purchasers are encouraged to look to substitute the imports with UK produced products they have a financial incentive in order to increase their purchasing power because now UK produced products are relatively cheaper than foreign produced products and so both these factors help promote increased demand for British produced goods and services. However, this assumes that demand for both imports and exports is price sensitive and this assumption may not be valid when non-price factors significantly influence consumer purchasing decisions. For example, people may still want to purchase their Apple iPhone or their Samsung Android phone uh, rather than look for British alternatives that they consider to be inferior. And in other cases the products may simply not be produced in the UK and so there is no opportunity for import substitution by UK consumers. For example, Britons are not going to start sourcing UK produced bananas because the climate is completely inappropriate. The second way in which lower interest rates promote increased economic activity is because lower interest rates encourage increased consumption of goods and services. That promotes greater economic activity when there is a risk of the economy entering a recession. And the reason that lower interest rates promote increased consumption is because First of all, lower interest rates reduce the cost of servicing debts and so people have more money available for consumption. If they're required to pay less for, for their mortgage, their mortgage repayments are reduced, then they have more available to consume goods. Secondly, lower interest rates encourage people to borrow more money as a consequence of the increased affordability of loans and the fact that they are having to forego less future consumption in order to bring their consumption forward into the current period. The opportunity cost in terms of future consumption is reduced uh, as a consequence of interest rates falling. So lower interest rates provide households and the corporate sector and government with a motivation to increase their indebtedness because of the lower cost, the increased affordability of loans. And finally, lower interest rates create an economic disincentive for saving and that causes people to reduce their personal savings ratio. Um, lower savings means greater consumption. So these forces together help to promote increased consumption in the economy as a consequence of lower interest rates. Lower interest rates create a wealth effect as rising asset prices cause people to perceive that they are wealthier. As I mentioned in previously in the lecture, lower interest rates lead to increases in asset prices.
and that makes people feel wealthier. And when they feel wealthier, they may decide to purchase a more expensive car, ex purchase a more expensive house because they are wealthier. And so this wealth effect, as a consequence of lower interest rates, can also promote greater economic activity in the economy. And the fall in sterling exchange rate, the increase in consumer spending, helps to promote increased business investment. And also increased business investment is a consequence of businesses having to pay lower interest rates on any money they borrow. So they can use a lower discount rate when in evaluating future investment projects. Finally, increasing consumption in the economy, growing consumer expenditure, increasing business investment, both promoting increased economic activity lead to expectations amongst both consumers and businesses that the economy will improve. And so they tend to reduce saving. They, it encourages consumption because they feel as though they're going to be richer in the future. And this creates self-fulfilling expectations, growing consumer expenditure, growing investment, growing confidence in the economy, help to grow the economy. However, there is also a risk that an interest rate reduction will cause consumers and business to believe that the economy is in trouble, which could lead to an increased rate of saving and a deferring of both consumption and investment that would actually lead to a deterioration, a contraction in economic activity. So the way that consumer and business expectations will change as a consequence of interest rate changes is not clear cut. And that is the end of lecture 10.